were people lying uh, in between the tracks. People started saying prayers. Ten minutes to nine. To Thursday morning rush hour on the London Tube. With uh, little or no clothes on. Bombs Breaking exploded in three bombs. crowded tube trains and an hour later a fourth went off in a bus carrying many who'd just been evacuated from the underground. The doors had been blown out. It was, it was quite horrific. 52 people were killed and 700 injured in Britain's first ever suicide attacks. A lot of people with terrible burns, all their hair has been singed off, their eyelashes. Their, and hundreds you know, more were traumatised. When the emergency services got there, they had to carry up um, people in, in, in blankets who had lost limbs and, and broken bones. I mean, there were people that we couldn't, we couldn't help. Amongst the confusion and panic, though, came dozens of professional emergency teams. This is the calm voice of Sandy Davis Roberts. In 2005, she was a senior paramedic with the East Anglia Ambulance Service. But then there's like people that have died around about. This is their resting place. You know. For Sandy, it was a case of helping save people amongst the wreckage who did still have a future. To a lady that burns, and she was angry. Uh, there was a young man, his leg was quite a mess. He was um, praying. The attacks on July the 7th came one day after the City of London had won its bid to host the 2012 Olympic Games with a campaign which had highlighted the city's multicultural population. A quick scan down the list of the names of people killed a day later proves that point. Three of the bombers themselves were British-born sons of Pakistani immigrants, while the fourth was born in Jamaica. In 2005, Sandy Davis Roberts was a veteran of 16 years as a paramedic and then working at Huntingdon, about one and a half hours out of London. I loved it. I really did love it. For her, it was the everyday satisfaction of seeing people she's helped survive. But on the 7th of July, that was put to the test after she and many of her colleagues were told to head towards London to help. Well, I thought we were going to go down there just to do all the local jobs while they dealt with... The emergency, yeah. And then we got a call from them to, to head towards Oldgate tube station. We didn't have GPS then. We just had roadmaps that I was desperately trying to find out where I was supposed to be. But we got there, and outside the tube station was all obviously all shut off. And there's actually film footage of us parking and getting what we needed and, and running towards the entrance to Oldgate tube station. Tell me what you're carrying. Oh, defibs, bandages... Uh, fluid for drips, a uh, gas called Entinox, which is a pain relief, um, anything. We had a big backpack and we, pl- we had a thing called the new pack, which was an artific- artificial ventilation. And then we followed this, um, went into the area and it was just black. It was, and the fire brigade had sort of fitted temporary lights <clears throat> up so we could because it's quite a long, you know, people go down the escalator. It's actually quite a long way down. We were running. So we got there and they said, right, we need to go onto the line, walk up, because it was in between two stations. Um, we've got people out, but we've got people still trapped. Probably about 100 yards we walked. It was all very hazy, smoky, really quiet. And then you sort of came across this scene of utter carnage. Like hell, I would imagine so. Mm. I would imagine so. What had happened? It was a middle carriage, because the the one in the middle was just completely gone, because it was packed. I mean, there were there must have been fifty or sixty people in each carriage. What was your job? Uh, just seeing who was who needed the most help, who was walking wounded. I mean, there were people there that we couldn't we couldn't help, mm. but um, it wasn't actually what I saw. But the smell of the place, burnt rubber, burnt hot diesel, hot mechanical smell. The noises were just, I don't know, just trying to cut people out and, you know, machinery. And there were surgeons down there that were operating. <laughs> there was a guy there that needed his leg cut off because he was, it was trapped under this mangled mess of metal. Mm. I can remember um, when the surgeon was operating on this guy, the suction the suction and the uh, ventilator going, remember that? Um, I was moved over to a lady that had been um, pushed right back 
against the joining of the doors and was trapped actually in the door. And she had burns and she was angry. She said, you know, how can these people do this? Um, was she using strong language? Yes. <laughs> there was a lot of strong language that day, and not just from the patients. She was upset. I mean, I think she was... I think I would be the same in the same situation. That would, would she get out? Would she get out? Would she get out alive? Would she see her family? All these questions go through your mind. Um, but I, I um, put in a drip in, you know, put in the plastic tube in the or a needle in the back of the hand. Um, put, give her some fluids, gave her some oxygen, treated her burnt because her face was on the on the right side was actually quite badly burned. Put a burn dressing around her head, talking to her about anything. Fel Felicity, Felicity was her name. So I think I gave her some morphine, and the surgeon came over and asked me if I was all right. Was the lady okay? I said, "Yep, yeah, she's just trapped." She, I said, "She's trapped." So what the fire brigade did, they went near the other side of the door <clears throat> and opened the door from that end very carefully because her arm was sort of behind her mm. and, and trapped in the door. So they cut that part of her free and then she, her foot was caught under one of the seats. And, but it took, it took us about an hour to get her out. They were taking people up to the top. She went, thank you. I said, all right, you're welcome. <laughs> And then I, do, I was just putting my stuff back, and they said, right, over here. Um, um, uh, there was a young man, not not English, couldn't speak very good English. He was um, praying, doing his rosary. And I said, he, uh, where are you hurt? And I, he said, leg. <laughs> I think he learned to say that, leg, and he pointed, and his leg was all, um, the bottom from his knee down was quite a mess. He sort of slid under the seat. And I think somebody that had sort of fallen on him. And I said, do you mind if I look at your leg? And he was just going, oh, yes, 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 look. You, you look, you look. <laughs> I said, OK. So, yeah, and it was a mess. Shredded, it looked like this. Lines of wounds. I mean, his calf was like, hanging off. And his foot was still intact, so just... Cleaned him up best I could. Like he was doing his rosary and I thought, well, that's obviously bringing him peace and he's calm. The fire brigade then lifted the seat and they got him out. Um, and then as I said, I'm sort of running out of some my kit then and uh, the, the same uh, surgeon that came over sort of called me over and he said, can you just come and assist here? And I went over and they were, um, he was actually stitching together um, a lady's face that was um, uh, how can I describe it it was though her face had slid round <laughs> if you know what I mean and he was trying to stitch to the top of her nose to her eye I would say she'd hit something on she'd been thrown off her feet yeah so I was just you know, I was holding her hand and very smart businesswoman very well dressed what you've got to remember is that we're doing all this, but then there's like people that have died around about and that you have to be respectful of, you know, because this is their last resting place. Well, I think the plan was to get everybody that could be got out, out and, and then sort of recover the bodies. But then we were told to go to come out of the carriage. Uh, so we got out and we went back up and I was surprised that it was sort of dusk. We've been down there four or five hours. And actually, it's quite... I mean, I've been to accidents as well where I felt, especially in, in, the, in the dark, and the fire brigade have got their um, lights on, um, that you're like, just like in your own little pocket of time. You know, there's just you and the... You know, there's just this little scene, and this is, this is it. Just time just went and uh, came up, and obviously we were... Yeah. We weren't looking our best, <laughs> and and the and the what they call the gold commander, who's like in charge of the whole scene, said, "Right, go and get yourself something to eat and a drink, and you can make yourself your, your way back up to towards Cambridge." 
So thank goodness for the London Fire Brigade who ha always have a mobile canteen with pies and hot drinks and whatever you want, really. So we went and got something to eat. Just shoved what we had left back into the ambulance and drove up towards Peterborough. There was, there was hardly anything on the road. But yeah, just sat for a little while, just contemplating. I was tired. Um, didn't finish till 1 a.m. the next morning. That was my day. You know, I, at first I was, I didn't want anybody to know that I'd actually done anything down there. I felt that I was a bit embarrassed. <laughs> Is that because you didn't want to be a hero? Well, uh, well, there were lots of heroes that day. I mean, at the end of the day, you're just doing what you're trained for. It wasn't the, until a, about a week later when we were all called for a debrief. Yeah, and we were encouraged to talk about what we'd found and everybody's to say, how did you, how were you involved? Anything that you could remember from that day, well, you were encouraged to talk about it. And then if any, if you felt that you needed more than that, then there were people there to help you with that too. It was only then that I realised that I'd been part of this team that had responded on that day. It was us. It was soon after that Sandy had to attend to two victims of particularly brutal violence, which eventually gave her recurring nightmares. Finally, she'd had enough. Within two years, she and her elderly parents left the United Kingdom to join a son in Canada, and then late in 2008, she came to New Zealand to live. Sandy Davis-Roberts is proud of her daughter, Amy, who works as a paramedic back in England. But Sandy herself has never felt like getting back behind the wheel of an ambulance ever again. This is David Stimson. 